We're almost done looking back at 2018, which is good since 2019 has been very rude and decided not to wait to start releasing major titles until I was done. So before we do our big countdown of the best books of the year, let's count down the top 10 moments of 2018. These are the moments that made us gasp, cry, laugh. Basically, they're what made us glad to read comics. But there were so many big moments from 2018 that I couldn't fit them all into a top 10. So to start us off, here's a few honorable mentions. The Justice League is reformed. After the nightmarish war with Barbatos that sucked the earth into darkness, Dark Knight's Metal ended with a big beacon of hope when we saw the Justice League reform and we got a sense that the DC Universe and their heroes were closer together than ever. But because of the way that comic books work, we all kind of already knew that this new Justice League book was on its way months before they actually made the announcement in the comics, and that did end up muting this surprise a little bit. So I couldn't actually put it on the list, but I did still think it was worth a mention. The Death of Flash Thompson it's rare these days that a character's death can truly capture them at their best, showing them being a hero in a way that encompasses their entire journey. But seeing Flash Thompson giving it everything that he had to save Spider-Man from the Red Goblin was truly a touching moment for this character that left us with a heavy heart at his passing. However, I've got a couple other deaths on this list and I just didn't want to make this whole top 10 really morbid. Speaking of morbid, Wally West versus Hunter Zolomon. For longtime Wally West fans, seeing him go head to head with Hunter Zalman, claiming his spot as the fastest man alive, was a moment that summed up the history of this character in one climactic battle. In fact, for a long time, this was on the list. I went through and revised this list several times, and it almost made it onto the final draft, but I couldn't help it. Every time that I thought about this moment, I couldn't help but think about what happened to Wally next. Something that ended up retroactively taking away almost all the impact of this moment. I know that might not seem fair, but honestly, it did kind of suck all the air out of this scene. I couldn't think of a way to talk about this moment without talking about what happened to Wally next. And that did kind of take everything this moment set up and paid tribute to and just sort of threw it right out the window. So, yeah, I couldn't bring myself to put it on the list. But now, on to the official number 10. Goodbye, Batrock. When Gwynpool began, I'll admit, I was super hesitant. I mean, it was a character created as a joke for a cover. How on earth were you going to stretch that out to be its own series? And yet... I was proven completely wrong, as this title ended up becoming one of the most fun and clever books I read over the past two years, with a truckload of heart behind it. But at the beginning of 2018, it came to an end, and one of the things that made Gwynpool unique was that she knew she was in a comic. Meaning, her last few issues were dedicated to her realizing her title was getting cancelled. It was pretty heavy, but one moment that really stuck with me was the last adventure she had with her fellow mercenary, Batrock. Batrock, for decades, had been little more than a joke and a French stereotype, but this series actually had him establish a connection with someone. We actually started to care about Batrock. But then Gwynpool realized this was her last adventure with him. And when this title was over, he'll live on. He's been around for a long time. He'll definitely pop up in another title, but he'll go back to being a joke. As if everything that had been done to this character in this series never existed. She realized this was like saying goodbye to him forever. Because this version of him, the version that we had come to know and care about, would never be seen again. No one would ever write him this way again. He would go back to being a clown for Captain America to punch. I had to put this moment on the list because even though Batrock didn't die, this was actually kind of sadder than a death because characters can die and come back to life all the time in comics. But to see a character you enjoyed lose who they are because you know no one will ever write them the same way again, that's something that won't come back. And honestly, it's a pain that comic book fans know all too well. And this moment stopped to say, hey, comic book fans, 
We know how much it sucks when something like this happens. And even if you didn't care about Batroc in this book, this made you stop and think about all those times it did happen to a character that you loved reading about. It's a really specific kind of sadness that only comic book fans really understand, and this book stopped to really acknowledge that. Number 9. Who is Spider-Man? I know everyone was talking about what a big deal Dan Slott leaving Amazing Spider-Man was this year, and they should have. It was. He was on that book for a decade. But even though Chip Zdarsky was only on Spectacular Spider-Man for roughly a year, he still went out on a high note unlike anything we saw from the character this year. He did one single issue all about someone doing a documentary on how everyone views Spider-Man, including one incredibly touching story from a mother about the relationship her son had with this hero. It all leads up to a finale where Peter himself tries to put into words what he thinks Spider-Man is, and it honestly is one of the best summations of a character I've ever read. This isn't a big epic moment that will change comics forever, it was just a small personal exploration of a character, but it was done so well it deserves to stand side by side with Spidey's greatest moments. Number 8, Avengers Assemble. Over the past 14 years, the Avengers have been dividing up more and more, splitting off into various teams with various purposes and motivations, and even though many of them have been great, they've never really had that big Earth's Mightiest Heroes on a day unlike any other vibe to them. In fact, I've often said that I thought that by dividing up the Avengers and expanding their roster so much, it kind of takes away the importance of what it means to be an Avenger. But this year, during the No Surrender event, we got a massive storyline featuring every Avengers team coming together. And at the end, as the very world shook, these characters charged into a climactic battle to save the entire planet. Just like how the last entry was up here because it made us go, that's who Spider-Man is? This entry is here because you look at this truly epic moment, with the world falling apart and the heat of battle rising to a boiling point, and you knew that's who the Avengers are. After years of the Avengers just sort of being whatever we want them to be in whatever book we want them to be in, or just constantly fighting amongst themselves, this was the moment that announced with a thunderous voice, no matter who is on this roster, no matter how much they split up, or where they go, or how big they get, this is what the Avengers are. This moment captured them so well, that as they charged into battle, I could hear their freaking theme song blaring the moment they shouted out, We saw so many characters, many of whom had hardly ever even interacted with each other, coming together and using their unique skills and powers perfectly together, which is something that has always defined the teamwork on the Avengers. Whether it be their might, their speed, or just their wit, this was almost like the moment that every Avengers team over the past generation came together to prove why every single member had earned the title Earth's Mightiest Hero. It's one of my favorite Avengers moments of all time, and honestly, one of my favorite moments from any team book, period. Number 7, Thanos Wins. Donny Cage's Thanos series saw the greatest villain of the Marvel Universe blasted into the future, to the end of days where he came face to face with his older self. After defeating the last thing that could possibly challenge them, they were left alone, the two of them being the only living beings in the universe. But the older Thanos had a reason to bring his younger self here, because Thanos' true love is death, and he is forever cursed to be so strong that no one could defeat him. No one could possibly kill the mad tyrant and bring him to his reward. No one but himself. The two of them entered a battle for the ages, the last battle at the end of everything. But as the old Thanos lied there waiting for his younger self to finish the job, his younger self looked at him, old and begging for the end, and he couldn't believe what a failure he had become. 
He had conquered all of existence, and yet in the end, he could only lie there waiting and begging for help, and Thanos couldn't accept that. So he went back in time, leaving his older self there begging for death, only for the world to crumble around him. In that moment, his older self realized what he'd done, that Thanos had won. He had found a way to defeat his older self while still denying him the release he'd been dreaming of. He went back in time and prevented himself from ever becoming the old Thanos we saw, thereby changing the future and erasing this Thanos from existence. This was honestly a brilliant finale to this storyline because Thanos delivered a victory that was so cold and calculated it reminded us that Thanos is truly a threat that cannot be stopped. Number 6. The Reveal of the Black Barn Gideon Falls is a series about a priest who has lost his faith. He's questioning his role in the church, so they send him down to a small rural town where their last priest vanished. The moment he sets foot here, you can tell something isn't right. There's a sense that something is in the air, something ominous. But one night he is awakened by the ghostly image of the priest who went missing, who then leads him out into the middle of a field where he is greeted by the Black Barn. This makes the list partly because in retrospect you see what a huge moment this is. As the series goes on and you understand how evil and terrifying the Black Barn is, it makes you realize truly what an impact this moment would have on the series. But even when you were in that moment, when you didn't know the history of the barn or what was coming next in the series, you could feel it in your bones that this was something to be scared of. The way that they shot the barn is so jarring it almost makes you jump as you turn the page. You can tell from this one single shot that nothing good will come from interacting with the Black Barn, that you should turn away from it now, and yet... It just calls out to you to keep reading, to keep learning these dark secrets. Number 5. Superman Picks a Side We have been waiting for years to see what would come from the revelation that Dr. Manhattan was responsible for the changes that happened to the DC Universe, and when Doomsday Clock began, we went in thinking it would be some immediate answers to these questions, but instead this book let us know it was going to take it's time, slowly introducing one player after another, moving them all across the board like a big game of chess, while tensions continued to rise and grow between characters and nations as it felt like at any moment things could hit a tipping point. That moment came when Firestorm was attacked by a group of Russian superheroes, accidentally unleashing a blast that transmuted every human around him into glass. He kept trying to reverse it, but it wasn't until Superman arrived, giving him the encouragement he needed that he was able to finally bring a young boy back to life. Superman stepped up to try and tell the Russian government that they now had a chance to save the rest of them. But they thought it was impossible. They thought it was a trick, so they started firing upon Firestorm, destroying some of the victims he had turned to glass. Superman knew they were killing these people who could still be saved, so he fought back, which caused the Russian heroes and soldiers to call in bigger forces, shattering every last one of these victims. This was the turning point this series had been waiting on. We had all been seen here wondering what was going to come from all this talk of a war breaking out, of all these other superheroes being formed by other nations to fight our heroes. We had no idea when things were finally going to blow up, and that's exactly what happened in this moment. The big war that was brewing in the background this whole time, this was the moment it was going to start. Number 4. The True Mastermind Behind the Wedding of Batman we had a year of build-up to the marriage of Batman and Catwoman, and I'll admit, we were all suspicious about whether or not this was actually going to happen. I mean, marriages in comics these days tend to rarely actually come to fruition. And the marriage of Batman and Catwoman? That would change comics forever, so the odds of that actually happening were next to nothing. But as the months went on, it felt like there was something in the air. Like, this might actually be different. Like, this could actually happen. The romance felt real. They were addressing all of the issues. They went through all the steps. Everything was in place. And, of course, Lucy yanked that football away from us all over again. 
Yes, the wedding didn't happen. Catwoman, after months of hearing people say Gotham needed Batman and Bruce can't be Batman if he's happy, decided to leave him at the altar. But as Catwoman's maid of honor, Holly, returned to Arkham, she went down into the basement to find Bane sitting there on a throne surrounded by every villain Batman had faced over the past few months, letting us know that everything that had happened was all according to plan. This one single panel made us look back at Batman's entire world over the past year and second-guess everything we had read while also wondering what was going to happen next. Few moments in comic book history can have that kind of an impact in one single panel. Now before we continue I have to issue a warning. Next up at number 3 is an entry from a book some people might still be waiting to read and unlike most superhero books it probably still hasn't been spoiled for most of you. So if you haven't finished Tom King's Mr. Miracle series then skip ahead to the time shown below. Alright? Because number 3 is Mr. Miracle defeats Darkseid. For a year, we saw Scott Free, Mr. Miracle, struggling to deal with two lives. The life of a new father raising his son alongside his wife as they built this family together, and a soldier who was now in charge of the armies of New Genesis in a battle for all creation against the hordes of Apocalypse. The battle had waged long and hard, and Scott's armies were failing. So as they entered negotiations with the leaders of Apocalypse, they were stunned to hear that Darkseid was offering to surrender. He would give up and end the war if Scott gave Darkseid his son. After days of thinking it over, he decided they only had one choice. Pretend to take the deal and then kill Darkseid when his guard is down. They made their way to Darkseid's throne room along with their son and a vegetable tray. I know that sounds out of place, but it's actually a running gag throughout the series and trust me, it's actually quite funny. Then they finally made their move, only to immediately remember, oh right, Darkseid doesn't go down that easy, as he proceeded to beat Mr. Miracle and Big Barda to within an inch of their life. Scott could barely stand as we watched him struggle to just crawl to his son's side as the baby's cries became deafening. Each panel of Scott struggling to get back up made you feel the crushing pain he was experiencing. But as Darkseid came in for the final blow, he reached up into the vegetable tray and pulled out the knife that they smuggled inside of it. A knife that was made from the flesh of Darkseid's own son, giving it the power to actually pierce his skin. Scott stabbed him over and over again, screaming and wailing in pain and anger. This moment was so cathartic because we had seen Scott suffering both physically and emotionally for an entire year now as the weight of this battle and his world kept ripping him apart. But in this moment, you could just feel an entire year's worth of torture and pain coming out all at once as Mr. Miracle finally won. He was finally free. And it was all thanks to a running gag in the background of the series, and I don't care who you are, no one out there saw that coming. Okay, so as I said, for that last one, I considered it to maybe possibly be a spoiler. When it comes to comics, spoilers are kind of a weird thing, because you see new books gain promote, and to see those new books gain promote, you already know what happened in other books, so what is a spoiler in another medium wouldn't be a spoiler in this. However, for the Mr. Miracle series, I did consider that one to possibly be a spoiler because I don't think everyone out there who is going to read that book has already read that book. Same thing goes for this one because I promise you this is a major spoiler and it's for a series that many people are waiting for it to end before they start reading it or they just started reading it and they're still catching up. So if you have not read Saga yet, skip ahead to this time. I'm not kidding you. This is not a teeny tiny thing. This is something that if you have never read Saga and you're thinking to yourself, oh, maybe one day I'll check that out possibly. I don't know for sure whether or not I'm going to read it. Don't risk it. Skip ahead to this time. Don't even read the comments down below. Don't Google Saga. Just move ahead to the time shown below. Okay, last chance. 
All right, I warn you. At number two, from Saga issue number 54. Again, if you are not all the way caught up, skip a head. From Saga number 54, The Death of Marco. Yes, even saying those words hurt because I still can't believe it happened. Saga is a series all about a young couple in love raising their daughter, and we thought we were going to follow them for years. We were going to watch them grow old together, and while we had seen characters die before in this title, we thought, oh, at least the main three characters are safe. But this year, when the will the hunter who had been tracking them since the start finally caught up to them. It looked pretty bad, but this family had been bad situations before, and they always pulled through, right? I'm sure it'll be okay. But we learned immediately that it was not going to be okay. It was not going to be like those other times, as the will proceeded to tear the head off of Prince Robot right in front of Marco. This had been one of the longest running supporting characters in this entire series. A character who had a huge role in this overall storyline, and the will just killed him like that. At that point, Marco, the peaceful man who had always looked down on violence, charged at the will in a fit of rage, and the two of them had a knockdown, brutal fight. And when it was over, Marco stood at the window of the ship he was trapped in, looking down at the planet his family was on leaving us to wonder how he'd get back. When would he be reunited with them? And how would they possibly find each other? Only for the next panel to reveal the Will standing behind him, punching a hole into his chest. Marco collapsed to the ground, dead in a puddle of his own blood, as the series started a one-year-long hiatus, leaving audiences to just sit there and just think about this with no answer of what's coming next. All we can do now is just mourn the loss of this great character. But now for number one, a moment that was the climax to years of storytelling, a moment that got our hearts pumping even when it brought a tear to our eye, the death of Jane Foster. For years, we had seen longtime member of the Thor family, Jane Foster, battling cancer, but when Thor lost the ability to lift his hammer, she knew there must always be a Thor. So she took the responsibility upon herself, donning the mantle of the Goddess of Thunder, and for years she protected the Earth with this astonishing power. However, every time that she lifted the hammer, it cleared out all the chemo in her body. Meaning, if she wanted to continue to be Thor, then she would just keep getting sicker and sicker until one day she was forced to face her fate. However, Malekith the Accursed and his army wasn't willing to slow down and give her some time off, and he launched his biggest weapon yet directly at Asgard. Mangog, a creature strong enough to rip the heavens apart. Jane knew how bad she had gotten. She knew if she lifted the hammer one more time, she would never come back. But, as she had said before, there must always be a Thor and a hero answers the call no matter what it means for themselves. So she lifted the hammer and flew to Asgard in time to do battle with this unkillable beast, giving it all she had, fighting for those she loved and for those who needed a hero for the sake of all the realms. And with her last act, she wrapped the beast in unbreakable chains, tied them to her hammer, and then launched it into the sun, forever banishing the Mangog and saving the people of Asgard. However, this came at a price, because as the hammer left her hands, she returned to Jane Foster, and her life faded away. Thor Odinson did everything that he could to save her, summoning up powers he thought long gone to try and restore life to her. All the while, Odin could just stand there looking upon her. He had been hunting her down with his righteous fury and was overwhelmed now to learn who she had really been. This mere mortal, dying a little more with every day that passed, had sacrificed herself to protect this realm and all of Asgard, something Odin himself had been too arrogant to achieve. Odin, the king of the gods, was humbled by the acts of this mortal, and so Odin looked upon his son, screaming and cursing the very stars themselves, and he told him that he was sorry. No god could possibly bring her back. At least, not by themselves. 
Odin then added his power to Thor's and together they were able to revive Jane Foster. This was the moment that deserved the number one spot for me because not only did it give us the climax to a story that had been building for years, but it was able to get our hearts racing as she fought with everything that she had. It brought a tear to our eye as she died, and then it gave us a wave of joy all at the end as she returned. And best of all, it sparked a turning point for the gods. The whole reason Thor couldn't lift his hammer anymore was because the gods had not done enough to help man. Mankind. They had viewed them as beneath them, but in this moment, you could see the gods had learned. They were ready to work for the safety of the Ten Realms, something that would lead us all into the massive War for the Realms event coming later this year. For all those reasons and more, it will go down as not only one of the biggest moments in the history of Thor, but easily the best comic book moment of 2018. Thanks for tuning in to our video today, everyone. Let me know your favorite comic book moment from 2018 in the comments down below. And make sure that you come back next week for the big finale to our last year retrospective as I proceed to count down the top 100 comics of 2018. If you want to see that, then make sure that you click that subscribe button, ring that bell, and you can always follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon at Professor Thorgy. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time.